issues pertaining to children with special needs, sensory processing, and other pediatric conditions. I am Dr. Kavitha Krishnan, the founder and pediatric occupational therapist for Healing Synergy. Uh, we are based out in North Carolina. If you have not already done so, please make sure that you click on the like button below or join us on Facebook uh, and Instagram because we've got a wealth of information we'd like to share with families. And today we have a very special guest, Dr. Heather Mulkey, who is a specialist in pelvic health. And uh, this today's um, session really is geared towards our caregivers. Without you, you know, our children need you. Uh, you guys do such an amazing job for our kids. And so I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Heather Mulkey to uh, introduce herself and tell us how she got into the field. Good morning, and uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a honor and a pleasure to be here, and um, I hope that I am able to help some of the caregivers out there. Um, my name is Heather Mookie. I am a specialist in physical therapy. Um, I've received my master's and my doctorate both in uh, physical therapy. Uh, so, but you can call me Dr. Mookie, or you can call me Heather. And um, I got into physical therapy. I think ultimately I got into physical therapy um, because my grandfather was a quadriplegic for the last 13 years of his life. And so it's hard to explain to a four-year-old why grandpa can't take you to the park. Um, and then once I was in PT school, I started learning more about more, at that time they were calling it more women's health. And um, I've always liked helping people who feel that there's no help for them. And um, when you break your arm, when you break your leg, you have a, a cast or a bandage or your arm is in a sling or you're wearing crutches. When you have pelvic pain, you don't have a bandage on your pelvis. When you have incontinence or sexual dysfunction, like you don't have a sign that says incontinent on you. So a lot of these patients um, suffer in silence. And so that just felt the need. I felt a pull to go there. And as I started learning more about women's health and pelvic health, I just fell in love with it and was like, this is where I'm meant to be. This is a very, um, there are not many of you who are specialized in this area. Would that be accurate to say? Well, when you look at how many physical therapists there are in general, there are not a ton of pelvic health specialists. However, you know, in I've been in the field now for over 20 years, and we've seen so many wonderful advances in the field from just education for therapists and people coming into the field. So I think it's, you know, continues to be a very exciting time. Um, technically, the field has been around um, for over 40 years. Um, there was a woman named Elizabeth Noble, who was a wonderful physical therapist who worked with the American Physical Therapy Association to create a section at the time, which was called the Section of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and that was to promote health for women before, during um, pregnancy. And then it just started spinning off because they're like, oh, well, women need more help than just before and during and after pregnancy, and they need help in other areas. And so then it became the Section of Women's Health. And now it's currently through the American Physical Therapy Association called the Academy of Pelvic Health. Um, so it, it continues to grow. And at one point, a lot of the education was just through the American Physical Therapy Association. And now we have lots of other options from Herman and Wallace. They have a wonderful uh, pelvic health foundation with a lot of good information. Um, and there's so many others just bright stars coming up and bringing great education out for both the practitioner and patients. Wow, that's amazing. Um, can you describe, um, maybe for you know people listening in, what exactly is pelvic health? Okay. If you could define it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's kind of hard to do so because pelvic health encompasses a lot of different diagnoses. So we work with anybody from who has pelvic pain and pelvic pain can encompass a lot of different diagnoses as well, but incontinence, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, uh, sexual dysfunction. We work with um, transgender patients before, during, during, and after affirmation surgery. We work with cancer patients who've had gone through cancer treatment and now are having different issues. If you look at the research out there with cancer patients, 
you know, um, pelvic health issues or pelvic health dysfunction increase substantially after cancer treatment. So dealing with more issues with urine, fecal, chronic constipation, sexual dysfunction. Um, I was going to say also trying to trying to think about all of them. I mean, we work a lot with uh, sacroiliac dysfunction. Um, there's also, I, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention just lymphedema. You know, we do have lymphedema therapists, but some people work together with that in the pelvic health and do lymphedema as well. I personally don't. Um, and there's also pediatric pelvic health as well. So we really encompass, you know, a wide variety of patients, a wide variety of diagnoses. Um, there can be certain diagnoses like pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, and that could mean anything from urinary incontinence urinary, which is urinary leakage, you know, mm -hmm. you could have, um, there can be pain issues, problems sitting, problems with intercourse, um, people who have to run to the bathroom multiple times at night, people who just go to the bathroom and they get back and 20 minutes later, their bladder is telling them they have to run back. So there's a lot of different ways that the muscles can have a variety of dysfunction. Um, we also like to look at, I mean, I love seeing my post cesarean sections to look at their scars to make sure their scar tissue is okay so that it's not binding down on their abdominal area or causing just problems with returning to normal activity, returning to exercise, returning to intercourse, things like that. Can you explain a little bit? Because I don't, usually what's the process after a cesarean section? What happens? I mean, what's the usual protocol from the hospital? Um, well, in the United States, there's really not much of a protocol from a physical therapy standpoint of view. You know, usually you have different restrictions that are given to you, like you're no, no heavy lifting for six weeks. Um, you know, you, you do a follow-up with your doctor, um, and then, you know, your doctor will clear you, and they, you know, they check obviously your wound site to make sure you're healing properly. I think now the good news is what I'm seeing is that a lot more people are, um, or a lot more doctors are referring patients to physical therapy, postpartum, post cesarean section, um, where before commonly it was, uh, there wasn't as much, I don't know if we weren't as well known or if it was a situation of just, um, you know, people didn't have as much access. Now, I still have patients that sometimes will drive two or three hours to come see me because they don't have good access around where they live. Now, luckily, that's getting a lot less. Like I had a gentleman and this was, you know, probably, this was a while ago, but he called and he said, oh, I'm going to come. And he had pain with sitting but he was going to drive an hour and a half to come see me to get treatment. And I, luckily I could say like, okay, you know, we have other, you know, resources that are closer to you that, you know, you could go see instead of coming to see me. So I'd really recommend, especially pain with sitting. If you have to drive an hour and a half, that's just going to flare you up every time. So he was able to be seen a lot closer to his house. So. But Heather, you just bring up something that's, um, you know, it's, it's just something that we do every day. We sit down. We have to work. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you have pain or discomfort, that's going to impede your productivity. I mean, your ability to focus or just get work done. Oh, without you know, a just... doubt. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, ultimately, a lot of these diagnoses lead to quality of life. You know, why, 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 why do we do what we do? It's because the person who has anything from interstitial cystitis to overactive bladder, these are different diagnoses that go along with bladder issues that where maybe a patient's getting up five times a night to go to the bathroom. With interstitial cystitis, I've had patients get up 20 times a night to go to the bathroom. So then you got to step back and say, you know, how long does somebody normally sleep at night? And if they're getting up three or four times a night, you can think about how disruptive that is to their sleep, let alone obviously 20 times a night. And then expecting somebody to be able to actually, you know, work and be productive or drive a car safely if they've had no sleep. So it really comes into just basic quality of life, of health and whatnot. You just opened up this whole whole can of worms really like because you can see so many different sections right mm -hmm. so it seems like it's across the board 
right? You can have pediatrics, younger individuals, and those who are much older across the lifespan. Exactly. And I think, you know, um, in the be you know, in the beginning it seemed like people would say, Oh, well, you know, pelvic health is for incontinence and only old people have incontinence. And that's not true. You know, I mean, we have stress urinary incontinence. Stress urinary incontinence is where people leak urine, where they cough, laugh, lift, sneeze. And there's research done that shows in the military, women in the fields are having a lot of stress urinary incontinence. And I forget the exact percentage, but that was, you know, there's been research done there. You know, in young female athletes, we're finding you know, stress, urinary incontinence, and other pelvic floor muscle dysfunctions that's being diagnosed. So the good thing is, is there's better diagnosis. There are more therapists out there, but we still have a long way to go. We need more research in our field. Um, you know, we need more practitioners. We do have some good um, education options, as I mentioned, that have really blossomed, you know, in the time I've been in the field. So I'm grateful for that. You've just hit so many, like, important areas you would not even think about. Um, but I'm going to direct your attention to um, mothers and uh, uh, pregnancies, really, because a lot of our families are, ch you know, children and special needs. And I'm not sure, I think this will be good information for them to, to you know, to know what's happening with their body, mm -hmm. what happens, what kind of issues that you see with uh, uh during pregnancy and then post-pregnancy as well. Great. Well, one of the big things, and yeah, thank you for directing me. I'm very passionate about uh, what I do and I love doing it, but there are so many different facets. But during pregnancy, I think one of the biggest things I see and that we actually can help quite a bit with is the pregnant mama who is having sciatica pain or pain that runs down their leg. A lot of times that's coming just from instability in the pelvis and some people say, oh, I have a hernia. I think I have a herniated disc. And the reality of a herniated disc in pregnancy is a very minute chance. Um, there's some research out there that says like maybe one in 10,000 at most. Um, but really, it's just the instability in the pelvis as the ligaments are getting more lax and getting ready to have this baby. You know, we have those hormones throughout our whole pregnancy. You know, so it's talking about teaching them better body mechanics and teaching them how to do some stabilization exercises that are safe for them and the baby and teaching them how to keep their body so that they can have a good pregnancy and not be in pain every day. There are certain pregnancy supports out there. Um, and it's important that you do see, you know, the proper individual, whether that be your doctor or a physical therapist to help figure out what's right for you. Is the problem coming more from your spine or is it more from the sacroiliac joint, you know, so farther down? So usually if it's one-sided pain, that's going to be more of your sacroiliac joint, which, you know, you definitely know, but your listeners may not know. If it's more midline pain, that's more of a lumbar issue. But we treat it a little differently. Like when you have one-sided pain, you want to make sure you're not doing any single leg stance. You know, if you're at home and you already have a baby at home and you have a baby gate up and you're trying to st stand on one leg while you're pregnant and flop that leg over, that's going to just create a lot of pain and dysfunction for that poor mama. And, um, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of myths out there as well. Like, for example, um, you know, people say, oh, we're going to put heat on this. Well, if it's a sacral iliac joint dysfunction, you know, heat is actually going to irritate that joint. So we can put ice on it, put a cold pack. Um, and it's funny because I tell people, I'm like, now, if your grandma gets upset about this and tells you don't put ice on it, you're going to hurt the baby. I want you to step back for a minute. Because if we think about the anatomy of the area, first we have the skin, right? Then we have this nice stuff called subcutaneous, which is your fat. Um, then we have the bone, we have muscles. So we have a lot of space before you're even going to get close to that baby. So putting an ice pack on the back, you know, the right side of your back or the left side of your back will actually be very helpful. You know, now they say you don't want to go into a hot tub because that's where you're submerging the whole body. And that obviously is bad because that can change the internal temperature for the baby. However, putting an ice pack is actually a very helpful thing that you can use for 20 minutes and you can do it a couple times a day. But so that sciatica pain, doing some basic stabilization exercises, 
you know, so obviously you would need to go to your OBGYN, ask to go to physical therapy and say there is something that can be done. You want to see somebody who does specialize in either pregnancy or pelvic health. And um, usually we see them a couple visits and it's very helpful for their pregnancy. So that's... Can I ask you, mm -hmm. um, like, how early on in the pregnancy would they start, you know, I know that there's changes in the body, but how early on would they kind of like anticipate to start seeing those changes? Um, it, it's going to differ for everybody. While there are general guidelines and things, the hormones affect each body differently. It's going to differ if this is your first pregnancy, is this, you know, your fifth pregnancy and, you know, what is your, um, you know, baseline of your health before you get pregnancy, you know, um, if you have pain before pregnancy, chances are you're going to have worse pain during pregnancy. And so that's, you know, if you have pain issues before, like make sure you get hooked up with a, you know, a pregnancy specialist or a pelvic health therapist to help you gauge through that because we don't have, you don't have to live in pain, you know, teaching simple things. Like when we think about it, we do so many silly things during our day. Like even when you brush your teeth, we all bend over to spit, right? Well, when you have a nice big pregnant belly in front of you and you bend over, that can actually be kind of painful, especially if you have sciatica. So why don't we just, instead of bend over from our back, why don't we bend with our knees? So there's very simple things. Teaching our pregnant ladies how to get in and out of bed properly, get in and out of a chair properly, uh, in and out of a car properly, things like that. How to give them more support. I was just thinking through what you just said, and you're right. You don't even think about it. You just automatically do what, you know, you've always designed, you know, your body's been designed to do. Um, it has, is there a change, or can you speak a little bit about a change with someone who's had one child and have had several different kids? Is there, like, something else that they might be, might present? So, well, you know, it, it starts looking at, um, when I when I evaluate the client that comes before me. I want to know what pregnancy this is. You know, have they had any complications in their pregnancies before? Because that's going to help give me a, a basis of what they may expect in the future. Um, now, sometimes people will have never had a problem and all of a sudden this is their third child. And um, now they're having problems and they're like, but I'm a healthy person. This doesn't make sense. But then you ask them, you know, well, tell me about your other pregnancies or tell me, you know, how your kid, you know, how many kids you have at home and I say, oh, well, my first child is five years old. And then I went and I breastfed them for two years and then I got pregnant again and I breastfed that one. I had a miscarriage in between and now I'm pregnant with this one. And what you can actually look at is if you think about like, if this is our basis of our hormone, when we get pregnant, our hormones change and they, and trust me, this is a very <laughs> easy explanation, which is far more and more complicated when we're talking about hormones, but your hormones change and they go really high. You know, when you go into delivery, they'll spike and then they'll come back down. But when you're actually breastfeeding, they'll still stay a little higher. So we'll see that sometimes people, their body has may not been back to normal in anywhere from five, seven years, something like that. You know, so that people, those, those women tend to have, I think, and there's, you know, they, they, I find there's more issues in that, in those scenarios and just about stability, you know, and just doing simple stability exercises. And that's why it would be great. And you see it some places that, you know, after delivery, you may get the opportunity to see a physical therapist, you know, in the hospital. It usually doesn't happen often. If we were in certain parts of Europe, that would be standard. So it's unfortunate that we are not following that here. It's a disservice to the moms. I mean, we're sending them home. They've just went, you know, birth in general is just a super traumatic experience. Okay. I mean, how the baby has to go out, the whole labor process is, you know, huge. And it's really, it's a traumatic experience and it affects every aspect of your body, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we don't do a good job of taking care of our mamas. You know, unfortunately, um, many people may not be able to afford to take a maternity leave. You know, some people may be only able to get two weeks. Some, I mean, in the United States, hopefully they're able to get there at least 12 weeks or longer. 
um, in Europe, you usually get a year in many countries. I know, I heard that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that really gives them both the time to, t- you know, get used to being a mama, take care of their child, take care of their own body, which is really important. And a lot of times you're thrown into this motherhood, or you may have other kids at home, so you don't really have time to take care of yourself or help to build back yourself. I mean, we're looking at ways for, you know, trying to prove and research that as, you know, how important preventive medicine is, right? And, and we, we see it. We see it coming down the pipe, definitely. Um, and that if we had one or two visits with people postpartum, just like, I mean, I would love to see, you know, you have, you know, your six-week post, you know, post-op with your doctor, you know, or post-birth um, with your doctor, you know, could we have a 10-week visit with a physical therapist? Can we make that standard? Could we do a two-week visit with a physical therapist, you know, to whatever week it is, it doesn't matter, but just have that be a standard of care because you would give the mom some education from basic body mechanics to helping understand what is normal, what's not normal. When I first got into the field and I was trying to do some marketing, I went to a OBGYN who is an older gentleman. And I said to him like, Oh, well, Hey, you could send them a physical therapy if they leak. And he's like, well, if you have babies, you're supposed to leak. So, <laughs> yeah. So not a great attitude to have there. But I said, well, if you leaked, I don't think you'd be really happy about that. And if you had the opportunity to make a change in it, wouldn't you want to? You know, and so, I mean, there is, a, there's, I think there's less of that mindset now, which is good. But we need to even have a better mindset of how do we get these mommies who, you know, it's normal to gain you know, 20 to 30, 40 pounds is considered normal, usually the 20 to 30 pounds. But we're seeing people gain 50, 60. A friend of mine's sister gained 100 pounds with delivery. And think about how that goes on the body and then coming back and then through, you know, the trauma of delivery, you know, and some, you know, some people have a vaginal birth. When we have vaginal birth, sometimes you'll have vaginal tearing. There's different degrees of vaginal tearing, you know, we want it. That's that's tissue damage. How are we supporting that t- tissue damage and getting it stronger? We obviously, after you're sewn up down there, you don't want to be exercising that right away. But you can actually start in small ways that are helpful. And where's the education piece? The parents aren't getting the education piece. And there. that's what I'm thinking because mm-hmm. if it's even if it's a C-section or you know a normal delivery, just bending down, you're picking them up. Do you ergonomically? Do you have you know the child? placed in a way that you are not hurting your body and that's what I see with the families that I you know go go to the homes that you can see the strain that they're going through every day yes yeah they're like but if I bathe my baby but my back hurts and I'm like well let's talk about ways you can do it safely or even just oh after I breastfeed I hurt I said well show me how you're breastfeeding you know and they have the great little baby boppy or whatever pillow you want to say and I say well now wait let's go and put one pillow there and then put your baby boppy or whatever on top of it and then put the baby there. They're like, but then my boob is hitting the baby in the face. And I'm like, that's exactly what you want to do. Because when you start bending over, you're putting more strain on your body. So talking about ways to both have the mama support herself and support the baby so that she can actually be supported as she's you know doing it. And then I try to cue moms of how to sneak in a little exercise because when you're a new mom it is so overwhelming like you don't have time like it's a good day if you brushed your teeth it's an even better day if you were able to take a shower right I mean I'm sure some people would be like yeah I hear that um you know so it's teaching them how to sneak in a couple exercises to help themselves to help their body show them how to do things easier to conserve energy and to still let them know that you know you know, newborns are hard. Newborns are really hard. And like, if you're having a hard time, ask for help, you know, and like, I think we are missing, you know, a lot of that education piece. And then depending, you know, where you're at, I'm in Chicago. And um, there are more resources in Chicago than maybe some little podunk town over here. And how do we make sure that I mean, I speak Spanish, but my, I, I don't truly speak Spanish. I, I speak this much Spanish. But how do we make sure 
that people who speak other languages, whether it's Spanish, Russian, Chinese, you know, an African language, are getting this education as well. You know, and it's hard. Um, I will work with interpreters sometimes, but not everybody has the luxury of having that to, you know, to help them with their education pieces. And I, I think I'm going to go back to that, um, the older doctor that you spoke to, because sometimes I think the new moms feel, I think this is part and parcel of pregnancy. I've heard other people talk about this. So this is what it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to have the bed you know, the, the achy back, uh, the leakage, uh, it all just comes with it, you know? Um, yes. I, I worked with one woman who is actually seeing her back pain and this goes back quite a few years ago and, you know, is asking if she leaked and I was, and well, no, not really. And I said, well, my question is a yes or no question. No, not really. Isn't really no. So is it yes? And so, well, a little bit, but you know, that comes normal. And then I asked her about her sex life, which she was appalled. I asked her about her sex life. And when I ask about sex, I'm not doing it because I'm nosy. I'm doing it because I care and I want people to have good, you know, good information. And I'll say, you know, are you sexually active? And some people say, well, no. And then I'll say, well, is that by choice or is there something stopping you? And so this woman had said, you know, why do you need to know if I'm having sex? And so I explained about the muscles down by the pelvic floor. And I explained to her how, you know, there can be dysfunction after childbirth. And she says, well, yeah, I have, I have some pain with intercourse. And she was blowing it off. And I said, okay, well, from zero to 10, how much pain are you having? And she said, well, it's seven out of 10. And I'm like, oh, that's a lot. And she said, well, my mom said sex would never be the same after birth. And I said, well, there, there is some truth to that. However, seven, it shouldn't be seven out of 10 pain. So she thought seven out of 10 pain was normal and that she should be thankful because she has a healthy child at home and that, you know, this is just how sex was going to be with her for the rest of her life. Now, the great thing is, is we worked together and she went back and she had pain-free sex, but it was, you know, she was at first shy to talk to me about it. When I brought it up, she didn't want to talk about it. And I tell people, I'm like, I'm going to ask questions about pee and poop. I'm going to ask questions about sex. And it's all good because this is what I do. And I'm here to help you. You know, okay. if I was, if, if I'm here to help myself, I'd be going to get a massage or doing something fun or exercising. So, um, but yes, there. You bring up such such a good point because that's what i think happens you know people assume like yep it's going to change this is going to be uncomfortable and that's how it is because that's how my grandma was and you know mm -hmm. everybody else i've spoken to um so they just continue just existing that way well and or you know maybe birth did not go the way you expected it to maybe there was complications for you or your child and so that changes the whole focus so if you're leaking a little urine most people don't care you know, they're like, I got to make sure my baby's okay. I got to make sure that I have to go to this doctor's appointment or this doctor's appointment. Um, you know, I think that then it gets kind of pushed to the side. Or if you come home and you got to go back to work in six weeks and you have two kids at home already, how are you going to take more time off? Or if you have a child with special needs, you need to use your time to take that child to the doctor and not worry about yourself. So, I mean, there's so many, I, I, life is an onion and we have tons of different layers and everybody's onion is different. And as you start pulling back these layers, there's so many ways that each person needs help. And I just have to, you know, shout out a little bit about mental health, both prepartum and postpartum, because mental health in this country is, needs so much more help and needs so much more recognition. You know, first of all, like, if you have the baby blues, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. Your body's just out of sorts. And if for some reason you have concerns about hurting yourself or your baby, you need to call your doctor immediately. You know, um, so that's just a quick little shout out about, you know, no, mental health. That's, that's great that you put that in mm -hmm, there. Because um, I, I would, I, I, I'm not remembering offhand, but, you know, postpartum depression does happen and there's lots of ways to help and there's ways you can get counseling. There's different medications that help. And if you get counseling or medication, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It means you are a smart mama that's taking care of you and taking care of your baby and doing what's best. So, you know, please reach out if you're having any of those problems or questions. 
or even start feeling it. You yeah. Know? Because again, people go, I'm not really, you know, can, if you feel anything, just call. Exactly. Get people out there, mm-hmm. you know, to, to help you. And I think it's compounded even more with pain that you might be experiencing right after birth. And so you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm just upset, um, getting tired a lot faster, but that's the normal, I mean, it, it's a normal process, but there's help out there. Yeah. And there's lots of ways too to think about, you know, I even talk to patients about like, okay, who's in your circle that can help you? And I'll say, oh, I have nobody. I have nobody. And then I'll say, no, 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 wait, you know, so tell me. And so, and I'll say, can you ask your friend to make you a casserole to throw in your freezer? Can you, or when they're pregnant, I tell them, you know, oh, I'm just going to be relaxing. I said, make some food to put in your freezer. So after birth, you can just throw something in the oven or have something easy that's semi-healthy and not hard for you to make because you're not going to have time and you're not going to want to cook and you're going to be tired and you're going to have so much to do when the baby's sleeping. In reality, you should probably be sleeping as well. And usually they take some time to coordinate that rhythm and usually ask the parents like, one of you should be sleeping <laughs> while the other's away. You got you know, you got a tag team here. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And also recognizing too, you know, what does the single mom do and how to get help and support for the single mom. And it's really important. I, I laugh because at one point when my children were young, I just had a list on the side of my refrigerator of anybody I felt that I could ask for help just because in the moment I just couldn't think about who else and the, the baby's sick and, or I had to go to the doctor and my husband was at the fire department or whatever it was. And I just couldn't think clear who else. And I was like, I have nobody, but then I realized, wait a minute. So I'd go to my list and be like, okay, I can call this person. Or I can call this person. That's a great idea to have that list up there. Mm-hmm. Especially when you're exhausted, you can like, you don't think straight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've told this person, um, I was going to also say that in a couple of things that people don't think about is I see moms carrying the baby in one hand, you know, um, and then they have grocery as well. And then they're managing another child. And I'm like, Oh my God, like, yeah, there's just so much coordination going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't, you know, after birth, when that body is so unstable, you know, and your body's changing and trying to heal, like putting that little baby or having it on your hip is really not the best option for you because it gets you kind of off balance. You know, when patients are carrying those big, heavy car seats with the baby in them, there's like, you know, uh, there's, there's different little things you can snap the car seat into and push it and it makes it so much easier. You know, I tell patients like, you know, Let's, you know, if you do your grocery shopping, can you leave the heavy things in the car till later and pick them up later or have a partner or a friend help you do those things? Um, you know, it's asking, you know, even when you're postpartum and you have other kids at home, well, my three-year-old likes to be held. Don't be bending over and picking them up when you have pain. You know, you sit down on the couch and be like, come and come, come up and crawl into mommy's lap and then we'll do some snuggles. Instead of you going to pick the child up, go through that extra pain and instability. And then, you know, so it's, you know, educating them on how to kind of direct their children's to be more helpful and to empower them to protect their own bodies. You know, um, Heather, I wanted to say to you, when you know, when we first got introduced, I think I was blown away to know where you can get trigger points. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew you could actually, if, I was just wondering if you could speak about that because I don't think people know about that. And so now shame on me because I should have brought my pelvis to show you and I do not have a pelvis in front of me right now. We're going to get you back. Okay. Um, <laughs> but when you think about the muscles in the body, you have these muscles that basically run from the, you know, your front um, all the way to your tailbone. And those are called your pelvic floor muscles. And the pelvic floor muscles, there's different layers of pelvic floor muscles, depending on the resource you look at. There's two layers or three layers of pelvic floor muscles. There's a superficial, and then there's more a middle layer with, um, I'm spacing, um, I have to come back to you on that. And there's the deep layer of muscles, but in between, it's also the sphincteric and, or the sphincters and uh, myofascial uh, tissues as well. And um, but uh, 
So those muscles, they have different jobs. One, they hold everything up and in. And I'm trying to simplify this because this could turn into a three-day lecture. Two, it has a sphincteric or it's a closure action. So it closes around the urethra. That's the tube that your urine comes out of. It closes around the anus. So that's where your poop comes out of. So we want to keep those closed until we're ready to let them out. Three, there's a sexual function that these muscles help support from everything from engorgement of the clitoris and the penis to it helps with just sensation. It does things like help you poop normally. Um, and last but not least, I say it's your foundation. So we all think about what is the foundation of your house. How important is your foundation, Kavitha? Very. Very. Okay. <laughs> so we're sitting on our foundation right now. Those are those muscles that run from their symphysis pubis. That is the bone that's like kind of right above your crotch. <laughs> nice medical terms there. All the way to your tailbone. So those muscles run from the front to the back. Um, and so those are the muscles we're talking about and those muscles can get trigger points. Some people say, well, what's a trigger point? So I tell people, you ever feel like you get a knot in your shoulder and it just hurts so bad and you want somebody to push on it? Um, you can get those knots anywhere in your body. And actually the proper terminology right now, instead of trigger points is now we're moving to tender points. Okay. So that's the terminology we are supposed to be using. So tender points. Um, and you can do tender point releases and try to get the dysfunction out of the muscles and then teach how to strengthen those muscles back up. And I tell people, so like if my arms, let's see if I can, if my arms are your pelvic floor muscles and my head is your bladder, their normal job is to contract and relax. Now when they relax, there's a certain amount of muscular tone that they have that helps to keep everything functioning the way it's supposed to. Now, as we go through life for different reasons, we will see that things change and muscles can get weaker and then it's easier for things to fall out or they can get, they when they get weaker, sometimes they think, oh, if I add a little more tone and I tighten up, it's going to help. So usually when you tighten up, that's when you get the trigger points. So people think, oh, I'm having, you know, urinary problems and sometimes a doctor who hasn't really examined the problem say, oh, just do Kegels. Well, if your muscles are really tight like this and you're doing Kegels, that's not going to help. So it's important that you are, you know, you do see a medical professional to find out what's going on. And also, even though sometimes it's very, it's very normal that people have problems after birth, but sometimes women will also have issues around menopause. People will have issues after C-sections, after hysterectomies. Um, but you also want to just check in to make sure there's not like any other problems like a cancer going on or other problems as well. So that's why it's important to check in with your medical professional as well. There's just like a whole vast of different areas. So to see a pelvic floor therapist, uh, do you need to get a referral from a doctor? So um, usually, yes. Um, in the United States, in physical therapy, there are some states that are direct access. That means you can just walk into a physical therapist's office, but then it also depends on how you're going to pay for it. Depending on your insurance, your insurance may say that you have to have a prescription from your doctor to go to a physical therapist to receive treatment. You may get the evaluation, but to, they will only do it if you have that prescription from doctors. So it's usually a good idea to have that prescription. Um, so it depends on your state and what access you do have, but the most common practice is you get a prescription from your doctor and then you'd make an appointment to go see a pelvic health specialist. Um, and uh, then you would come to maybe me, for example, and when I meet you, I have you fill out some forms, a little bit about your past medical history, your gynecological history, different things um, like that, other surgeries you may have had. Then we bring you in, I go through, I ask a bunch of different questions, um, and then I'll spend some time educating a little bit about the, about the pelvic muscles in your body and what um, I'm going to examine on you, and depending on your symptoms, that would depend what I do, but usually I'm going to do a general screen of your body. I'm going to look at your abdomen. I'm going to move your legs around. Sometimes I'll pay a little more attention to your spine, um, but then usually I will do a vaginal or rectal assessment where I'm checking those muscles. Now, most people who've had babies really don't care about that. I don't have to do the rectal too often by any means. Um, it's usually basically more of a vaginal 
assessment to see what those muscles are doing. If there's dysfunction in there, are we finding trigger points, different things like that. And then I, you know, basically make a picture of that patient to figure out how am I going to get them better. And I say, I'm going to give you a tune-up. Who doesn't need a tune-up or a makeover, right? Because your body's gone through so much. Um, you know, and usually a normal course of physical therapy is usually we see about six times. Um, now, depending on the diagnosis, the history, it could be more, could be less. Um, there are different uh, physical therapy places out. There's some private practices that you can pay cash for, um, and those may not always um, uh, request a prescription from a doctor. So there's a little leeway here, but the most common practice is you usually get a prescription from a doctor, and then you would go to get scheduled, whether private practice, hospital-based, whatnot. And that just improves your quality of life. So. Without a doubt. Yeah. You know, from just the everyday function, you know, our jobs as, you know, the doctoring profession is that, you know, we are to find what's weak and make it stronger, what's strong and, you know, make it normal, find the dysfunction to help you have a better quality of life and be happier and healthier and learn how to take care of your body. My job is to teach my patients as much as they can so they can manage their body and keep it stronger. And I'll often say, like, you know, in general, you know, how strong are you? People say, oh, I'm pretty strong. And then we'll go through our evaluation. I said, okay, well, I, th I think, you know, you got some good stuff going on, but you're about here. And I think if we work, we could get you to here. And you could go to here. And the thing is, we really want to impress upon this health and wellness. Because as stronger, as strong as we make ourselves, then if something happens to us, if we get sick, if we're in an accident and something knocks us down, we still have had, we've built up our bodies, and that's going to help us recover from that. And we also want to maintain a proper, you know, health and wellness as we're getting older so that when you, your body does change or you have to go through a surgery or you go through menopause, and that's those are other things that potentially can knock you down a little bit. We want to make sure that we can still have good quality of life afterwards, and there's no reason why we can't. No, thank you so much. This has been a wealth of information. We're probably going to get you back again. <laughs> I'd be uh, happy to. Yeah, um, because I think just even at the different ages, you know, for, for a mom, your body is going through different changes. Yeah. You know, so if you've had your baby at 20 and then the next baby, say, comes at 35, that's something different. You know, what are you going to be looking out for? Um, so I, I know we can keep talking, so I'm definitely going to be calling you back again. Thank you. Um, I will ask, uh, you know, the audience if they if they want to ask questions, I'll forward, forward it to you so that you can answer it, um, uh, answer them. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, this has been incredible, uh, wealth of information, and we're definitely calling you back. Thank okay. you, thank you. It's been an <laughs> honor and a privilege to be here, and I think, you know, am I the perfect person, and do I know everything? No, I don't, but I do have the experience here. And if we can help give some good information out to other moms that are struggling, other parents that just need support, that's what this is about. And so it's an honor and a privilege to be part of it. Thank you. No, thank you so much, especially like, you know, you mentioned about the moms who have to go to the hospital, uh, you know, a typical birth, they go to the hospital, the children with special needs, it's a lot more. Yeah. And sometimes, and like you said, they, they put their needs in the back burner. Yeah. The moms of you preemies, know. the moms who have medically complex babies. I mean, there's so much here and there's so much time we could spend together. So we will plan another time. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you so much.